Okay, we're opening up uh, in this session. We're in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, if you would. We're going to begin reading in chapter 17, verse number 1. If you're following along in our Acts notebook, we're on page 205. Acts 17, 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. Good results. Verse 5, but the Jews believe, which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. Well, we're moving along. Again, the missionaries meet resistance and persecution for the gospel. We've seen that often. This wasn't a surprise to Paul and his company, and this is nothing new in the study of the book of Acts. It wasn't a surprise, for Jesus had warned his disciples specifically in Matthew chapter number 10, that they would face persecution. This is nothing new. We had mentioned uh, John the Baptist. He did right. He lost his head. Stephen did right. He was stoned as a result of that. We know that many first century Christians were persecuted, were executed, were martyred for their belief in their faith. So it shouldn't be strange to us. It shouldn't be something that... Uh, we would not expect, we should not be surprised if we, in our own culture, and we're protected by many of the laws of our culture, but we ought not to be surprised that Christianity is not found in favor with the general culture of the United States of America. And persecution, as little as it may be right now, I believe will continue to grow in time. Persecution will come when Christians take the gospel public. If Paul, Barnabas, Silas, Luke, and Timothy would have kept quiet, they would have enjoyed a much more quiet and serene existence. Our goal has been to carefully examine and evaluate the lives of first century disciples. What was important to them? That should be important to us. What were their priorities? What gave them the motivation to get up and go to work, so to speak, every day? What drove them to persevere in the face of certain resistance, trials, tribulations, <clears throat> and persecutions? What is it that motivates people like this? What is it that motivates people like Paul, Silas, Barnabas? Admittedly, this militaristic attitude is not very common in the 21st century. Why is this true? Um, I could say this, and I, I know I could be criticized for saying it, so I'm open. But we're pretty soft. We have uh, a pretty easy existence we're very comfortable in our culture and in our society, society today. We enjoy a lot of things that generations of past years didn't even imagine or think of. They never knew of, and we have them. And we're, you know, uh, pain is an evil work, and pain are evil words in our society. We have smart people with... Um, Ivy League degrees sitting around thinking of ways how we can avoid work and how they can make money by showing us how we can minimize the pain and effort in our life. 
I think of things like, and I love it, air conditioning. Air conditioning is a wonderful thing. I love air conditioning. But, uh, you know, what is the, your range of comfortability? <laughs> well, if it's below 68, I'm cold. And if it's above 75, turn on the AC. You know, we've got a very narrow comfort range. And that's just talking about the air temperature. When we come to sleeping and eating and recreation and all the things like that, we in our culture today have a very narrow range of comfort. And we're always trying to narrow that range to the degree that we can be totally comfortable all the time and in every place. So that's, kind of, that's a mentality that we have. So when we talk about work and martyrdom and persecution and things like that, it's kind of like we just kind of dismiss that. We don't want to think of that right now, you know. Uh, I hope I never have to be persecuted. hope I never have to be inconvenienced too much for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Living in our affluent Western and well-to-do culture, we are taught to pursue pleasure and avoid pain and inconvenience. That says it. If the gospel or sharing it is met with persecution and inconvenience, uh, we think it's something to avoid. We don't want to be persecuted. We don't want to have to be criticized or penalized for our Christian faith. So the best thing is just be quiet. The good feelings that we experience, whether they are psychological or physiological or neurological, all serve to addict us to pleasure. I asked the question at the outset of this session, what motivated these kinds of people, these, this group of people, these apostles and disciples to persevere? There must be some good reasons for one to do these things. So I've listed some reasons here on pay, at the bottom of page number 206. Let me just read through them. Paul had a personal confrontation in appearance with Christ. I've never had that kind of a confrontation. So I don't have that kind of motivation. Paul was caught up to the third heaven. I wasn't, so I don't have that motivating me. Paul was obedient to the Lord's command. The third thing, he operated out of a sense of duty. Now I understand what that means, and uh, I've had military experience, so I understand what doing what you're told is all about. Of course, I knew that. My father was pretty militaristic about that when I was a young man. So that motivates people. Duty. Four, Paul believed in the existence of an eternal hell. That's a great motivator, particularly when we look at our friends and our relatives and we know that, that every man, woman, boy, and girl ultimately will spend eternity in heaven or hell. And it's, uh, it's a very difficult to think of, that, to think about, that anybody that we know and anybody we love would ever suffer such an eternal fate. That ought to be a great motivator. Number five, Paul realized that his life was brief. You can't stop the clock. It's ticking even as we sit here right now. We are drawing closer and closer to our final breath in this life. Number six, Paul was focused on the reality of heaven. There is, there are blessings at the end of this journey that we call life. That motivated him. Paul recognized the relative unimportance of the physical, material, and temporal world when one compares that with the spiritual world, with the reality of Christ, the reality of infinity, the reality of eternity, the reality of true spirituality and truth. And then Paul believed that life, life was short and eternity was forever. So, we may inconvenience ourselves today for a brief period of time, but the rewards are eternal for the Christian. That's a great motivating force. And I think we need to, uh, more often than not, we need to focus our attention on some of, these, some of these great motivators. The American dream has become the American nightmare. We're psychologically, et cetera, addicted to the pleasures of life. And it could be that we've taken our eyes off the prize. We've created a veritable 
Vanity Fair, a Disneyland life where sacrifice and service and discipleship and self-denial and commitment, certainly to the things of God, seem to be distasteful. Pain and suffering, we've been taught, is to be avoided at all costs. Stimulating our reward centers has produced a spiritual laziness and malaise to the things of God. And we've been warned about this. We list several passages on 207 there. We know that Abraham, at the bottom of that page, had the right idea. This was his great desire. He looked for a city, Hebrews 11, a city whose found, who, which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Speaking of all of the people in Hebrews chapter 11, the writer says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. We are so blessed, and consequently so relatively comfortable that we've taken our eyes off the prize. We've taken our eyes, I think, off eternity, and we're very focused on the now and now instead of the sweet by and by. We're focused on our possessions, our belongings, our personal comfort, the foods that we eat, the clothing that we wear, the freedom that financial um, ability affords us to go on vacation, to buy a new automobile, to change houses. I saw a commercial on t television just recently. In the commercial, the individual said that Americans will live in 11 different homes in their lifetime. There are many people in this world that won't ever live in any home in their lifetime. We're going to live in 11 different homes? Well, all of that good stuff serves to um, neutralize us spiritually. We focus on the good things of the now and now, and we forget about or we postpone the things of, of the future. But Hebrews chapter 11 gives us some thoughts on that. We see that Paul wrote on page 208 of the notes, for our conversation, he said, is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior. Do we? We looking for the coming of Christ. We looking for Jesus to come. We ought to be. That's what Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Maybe we're not looking for a new body until we need a hip replacement or a knee replacement or we're dealing with some disease that could ultimately be terminal, a cancer or diabetes or some, something of that nature. And all of a sudden as we get older and we're faced with uh, the terminality of life, we think, whoa, it's going to be great when we get a new body. Did you think that when you were 18 years old? 25 years old? Did you think like that when you were 35 years old? Probably only if the body that you then possessed was suffering some serious defect. But my experience is it's not until people get older, I don't know, 50, 55, maybe 60 years of age, all of a sudden they become painfully aware of the fact that this body that they have been given really is terminal and that it is beginning, if it hasn't already, beginning to break down and come apart. And you know, the life insurance tables tell us that it will and the life that we live now will come to an end someday. So Paul wrote about those things. What are we looking forward to? Revelation 21 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. There was no more sea. Are you looking forward to those things? Our conclusion at the bottom of the page is the truth of the matter is that, I call it stuffitis, it's not a real word, I made it up, exists in epidemic proportions in the Western world. Materialism 
has distracted us and convinced us to settle for pleasure today and take our chances on tomorrow. The Bible teaches us to be spiritually motivated, however, to live a godly life and sacrifice today for a sure reward that is promised in the future. Do we have to have what we want today? Do we have to? Or can we pursue the Lord's will and priorities today to await His reward, which will be a far better reward, undoubtedly, than we are attempting to achieve for ourselves today? Well, let's continue in chapter 17 in verse number 6. They turned the world upside down. We're reading it, we're at about 51 A.D., It's about 20 plus years after the resurrection of Christ. And we read in verse number 6 of chapter 17, And when they found them not, well, remember, remember what happened here. The Jews, the lewd fellows of the baser sort, gathered a company, verse 5, and they set the city in an uproar. They went after the house of Jason, and they sought to bring them out. But when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar. These are political enemies. They're enemies of Caesar, saying, There's another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people. And the rulers of the city, they were great troublemakers. They made trouble wherever they went. When they heard these things, and when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. That's Paul. (laughs) Paul's always looking for Jews. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. We know him as the apostle to the Gentiles, but Romans chapter 10 tells us that he had an unending uh, love for his brethren, for his physical brethren, the Jewish people. Wherever he went, he felt compelled to bring the message, and he he was equipped, certainly, to bring the message to them. They troubled the people. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas. I'm in verse 10 of chapter 17. They sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. What wonderful examples to all of us. Therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women which were Greeks and of men not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea, but Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul, brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him, and with all speed, they, uh, let's see, uh, we'll we'll stop right there. Let's stop right there at the uh, end of verse number 14. My notes end at verse 15 there. We need to go back and check that out, all right? I think I'm missing a sentence at the end. So anyway, let's look at the introduction here to this. Average people leading average, non-eventful lives, trying to fit in and get lost in a sea of humanity are not worth studying or writing about. They aren't. They just aren't. Why don't we read books about people like that? We read books about people who are famous because they have... um, They have single themselves out as being exceptional, different. Maybe they had exceptional skills. Maybe they had exceptional strength. Maybe they were exceptionally wise. Maybe they were exceptional 
in a spiritual, in a religious way. Exceptional people. Maybe they were brilliant when it came to law, to medicine, to government, to society, to culture, to art, to science. We read books about people like that. Those people we deem as important. The people that we're reading about here in the book of Acts are those kind of people, important people. They have distinguished themselves among others because they did things that were uncommon, that were unique, and they demand our attention just to, at least to look at them and ask ourselves, what made them different from the rest of us? They're the kind of people, I suppose, that other people long to be. There is a, a young lady, she's not that young anymore, not that she's old, but uh, I believe it was in the Olympics in the early 2000s, maybe 2003, 2004, that she won the Olympic gold medal, female, Olympic gold medal in pole vaulting. She's from Rochester, New York. She's from a college. She was a uh, student at a college about 10, 15 miles from where I'm standing right now. Well, she distinguished herself among all the female pole vaulters in the world. And although many years have gone by, this lady is still seen as an example. She's a public speaker. She's asked to come to banquets and dinners to share her experiences and the things that, that uh, and the people that made her great and able to do something that uh, only one woman could do in those Olympics. That would be get the gold medal for that. There's another lady here in uh, uh, probably 10 miles to the northwest of us. She was an Olympic gold medalist, uh, fig not a figure skater, but speed skater. And uh, like the other uh, young lady, she's older than her, but like her, she's often uh, sought after to speak to children, to young people, to athletes again, sharing with them the things that she has done. Now, I don't know, there's not books, I don't think, articles, surely, but there's not books written about either one of these ladies, but uh, there may be someday, maybe someday I'll pick up, some writer will pick up on their experiences and, and write about them. That may take place. But the point is, the people that we're reading about in the book of Acts are exceptional people. They are uncommon. They are unique. These are the kind of people that we are to look to to be our examples for sure. Now, in this particular, um, uh, this particular chapter, this particular session, there are several things that made these individuals or distinguished these individuals from the rest. And we've commented on them. And basically, that's the message here. So let's just look through them. And you can read uh, what I have written, but we can mention them briefly and uh, conclude here in maybe about 10 minutes or so. What is it that made Paul the Apostle the kind of man that turned the world upside down? World attention, focused. Here we are 2,000 years after this man's death, his birth and death, after his lifespan, and we're still talking about him. We're still reading about him. We're still using him as an illustration of good things, an exemplary individual. Number one, on page 210, he was a courageous individual. Oftentimes we read the words bold or boldness or boldly that are referenced or affiliated with Paul the Apostle. He went to the synagogue of the Jews. Now, he suffered. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 gives you a liturgy, a list of things there that Paul suffered. And he asked for it. He was never afraid to confront a group. Of, in fact, he looked for individuals to confront with the truth of the gospel. He was a courageous 
individual. And his courage differentiated him, made him to stand out. That's why we're reading about him. What kind of courage did he have? He was an action-oriented individual. All of us have dreams. There's probably many young ladies that had dreams about being a gold medal medalist in the pole vaulting or a gold medalist in speed skating or a gold medalist on the USA basketball team or a um, USA gold medalist wrestler like Ben Peterson or John Peterson many, many years ago. Lots of dreams, lots of dreams. But how many actually have achieved those dreams? Paul the Apostle was an action-oriented individual. He was strategic, meaning he had a process. He had a plan in mind. you got to have a plan. When I started out this series of, uh, series of uh, videos, I had to sit down and think about, after uh, talking with others who were interested in participating in this, we ha I had to get an idea of what we would do, how we would do it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there was strategic planning that went into this series of uh, sessions on the book of Acts. Planning, strategy. Paul had a strategy. It says in verse 2, as his manner was. He had a strategy. What did he do? He went to the synagogue. He went to the synagogue. He had a plan. He had an itinerary. He had churches that he was going to visit. He had people that he had in his mind in his daytime or whatnot. Names. He may have had many of their names on speed dial on his cell phone. I don't know. But he had people that he intended to connect with. He was working together with a team of individuals. There was Paul and Barnabas and Paul and Silas and Paul and Timotheus and Paul and Luke and all these individuals working together. So people, people that distinguish themselves from others, they are courageous individuals and they have a strategy or they have a plan. Notice thirdly at the bottom of page 210, they are knowledgeable people. Now, when we're talking about spiritual things, they've applied themselves to the Scriptures. Taking a Bible Institute class or an online class or reading a book to gain knowledge about the Bible, spending time studying in the Bible, reading through the book of Proverbs, reading through the book of Romans, comparing Scripture with Scripture, writing notes, either in your Bible or on a notepad, doing things like that, becoming knowledgeable. It's important. It's how we distinguish ourselves. And that's how we become valuable. We look to courageous, strategic, knowledgeable people for leadership. I would assume that most people that would watch a video like that have a desire to be in a leadership position or maybe already in a leadership position. Let me let me encourage you in differentiating yourself in these ways. Let me give you the fourth. You're productive. We had to plan. I had to proofread. I had to prepare these lessons. By the way, these notes had already been prepared prior to ever being asked to do this series. They had already been taught. So I already had 300 pages of notes. I had already invested the study in preparing 300 pages of notes. Then I had to come up, or we had to come up with a plan to do this. We've got a plan. We've got to figure out how we're going to get this accomplished. And, we're, and we need to be knowledgeable in what we're doing. Then, so we had planning. We had uh, proofing. Proofing. Proofing was this. Proofing was proofing the notes. I wanted to make sure that the people who got my notes got a good copy. I wanted to get rid of the grammatical spelling errors, things like that from the notes, like I just didn't do in this session on verse 15. I wanted to get rid of those things. I'm still doing that. Every time I go through my notes, I'm proofreading. So we've had to plan. We've had to proof. Then we had to prepare. 
before I teach this, I've got to go back. Even though I wrote these notes and taught this before, I've got to get this back in my head again. I've got to go back and, and, and prepare myself to speak on this subject again. And then we have to produce. We've got to produce videos. We've got to produce notes. We've got to produce something that's worth sharing with someone else that we don't have to apologize for. We're not perfect, but we're, we don't have to apologize. We've made a good effort to do something well. What do leaders do? They're courageous people. They differentiate themselves with courage, with a plan, a strategy. They become knowledgeable in that which they are leading. They become productive. They, they accomplish something. In the text, some people believed there was production, there was accomplishment. They were preaching the gospel and people were getting it. And they did it persistently. From, from, uh, from un- Berea, they went to the synagogue again and again and again. They were persistent. And yet, at the same time, they were criticized. I don't care who you are. If you're trying to do something that other people aren't doing, you'll be criticized. You can sit there and find fault with all of these these messages and these videos. There's plenty of fault to find. No question about that. But hopefully there's much more good that can be accomplished. And if you will forgive me and put up with me for the errors or the foolishness or what you might consider a waste of time, we can accomplish something. Persecuted. They were, the house was assaulted. Yet, They were revolutionaries. For some, this is revolutionary. They turned the world upside down. I remember when I first started reading the Bible and started reading commentaries, books written by men who were knowledgeable and trying to gain more uh, understanding uh, in the Scriptures. It did. It did. It turned my world upside down. That was in 1972 and 1973. That was a long, long time ago. Many years. I never thought, I never dreamed that I'd be doing what I'm doing right now. I never did. But it turned my world upside down. It changed the whole direction of my life. It gave me a purpose and it gave me meaning in life. And that's what we're hoping to do as leaders ourselves. Let me review, okay? Can I do that? Number one, courage. Stick it out. Don't quit. When you start something, see it through to the end and be bold. Be bold about what you do. Be strategic. Make sure you've got a plan. Make sure you continually be a lifelong learner and gaining knowledge, and then produce something. In this case, produce believers, produce notes, produce something, produce a book, (laughs) produce, build a house, do something, accomplish something worthwhile. Be persistent at it. Don't give up. There will be persecution. There will be obstacles that you will have to Overcome along the way, some of them human and some of them not, and be a person that turns the world upside down. Upside down. So, we still have some things to say here in chapter 17. We'll do that in our next session. We're going to look at Paul on Mars Hill. We can really learn a lot from Paul on Mars Hill and how he dealt with a very different group of people. Peter was dealing with Jews, Jews who had crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3. Same thing with Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Then Peter was introduced to a new scenario, a new situation when he was introduced to Cornelius of the Italian band. And then we move into the missionary journeys and, and uh, the trips We're in the second one right now, Paul the Apostle. And now we're going to see Paul confront or be confronted by a group of people who are not Jewish, know little about the Old Testament law, 
if anything. I'm not really sure about that. But Paul now deals with these Gentile individuals. He has a different way of dealing with them. And he raises different issues with them than Peter did or Stephen did with the Jews. So we're going to come back in just uh, a few moments and we're going to look at Paul on Mars Hill. Let's take a break.